Aloha Kakao. Aloha. I'm Michael Bruno, provost at UH Manoa, and it is. <laughs> That wasn't even my wife. <laughs> so uh, this is an extraordinary turnout um, in recognition of the importance of the issue that we'll be speaking about tonight. I want to welcome you on behalf of the University of Hawaii at Manoa to the UH Manoa Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. Through this series, we seek to engage the community the broad community well beyond the campus uh, to address, discuss, and have meaningful conversations about issues uh, that are among the most pressing issues of our time, and certainly this issue we speak about tonight is. Uh, this spring, we will host renowned speakers, among other things, on the promise of microbiome research to dramatically change the way that we view and treat natural sciences, life sciences, medicine, and environmental protection. We will also have a speaker speaking on the ravages of domestic violence and possible solutions. And also on what we've learned from one of the world's longest running studies of health and well-being with groundbreaking findings on the elements of human happiness. I had to pick one topic that was upbeat. No, those. I can't wait for that one. In events such as these, we work to bring all elements of our community together. This requires extraordinary effort and teamwork. And I really first want to thank our own resident force of nature, Robert Perkinson. It is Robert's uh, vision, dedication, and most of all, his contagious enthusiasm that keeps this all going. Uh, we owe a special thanks to our core partner in this series, the Hawaii Community Foundation. And we are very pleased to announce tonight that Kamehameha Schools is signing on as an additional core partner of the speaker series. <laughs> Special thanks also, of course, to the Kahala Hotel and Resort, which is generously hosting us this evening and will host other events through the course of this year. Tonight's talk was intentionally scheduled to coincide with the state's annual climate conference, which started yesterday, and also with an eye on the legislature, uh, the legislative session, which will start tomorrow. There's simply not enough time to list every organization and individual that made tonight's event possible. Please take a look at the poster outside, say a word of thanks to our sponsors, most importantly, donate to their causes. Uh, to state the obvious, climate change is the challenge of our age. It is also a top priority at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We have extraordinary faculty, staff, and students where, uh, working on various aspects of this issue across disciplines as varied as engineering and microbiology, architecture, and the School of Law. In fact, this semester, through our Institute for Sustainability and Resilience, we are rolling out a brand new undergraduate degree program in sustainability and resilience with courses being delivered from 30 different departments across every single college on campus, which is an extraordinary testament to the, the power of the university. Our students, our faculty are out in the field, in the community, making a difference in this area. I want to call out just a few things, and I'm going to embarrass a few people. Three of our faculty, Dr. Chip Fletcher, who's over there. Um, Dr. McKenna Kaufman, where's McKenna? 
and Dr. Rosie Alagado. I don't think Rosie is here tonight from Oceanography. Uh, all three serve on the city's Climate Change Commission. In December, that commission produced a set of guidance on revising Oahu's shoreline setback with the aim of preserving our beaches. And our beaches are the best protection against the onslaught of sea level rise and wave action from storms. It is that soft sand that provides the protection to our infrastructure and eventually our homes. Um, our faculty are modeling the impacts of future sea level rise. Chip and McKenna and others are doing this daily. Um, a special sea level ride, rise hazard zone has been identified through their work and is being used by Honolulu, Kauai, and Maui counties to develop new coastal setback laws, building guidelines, and special management districts. We should all be proud in the fact that action is being taken in this state, not words. Researchers at the Hawaii Marine Biology, uh, Institute for Marine Biology, HIMB, have been working closely with federal authorities to develop new management protocols for coral reef bleaching across the Hawaiian Islands. Before we turn to our featured guest this evening, I would also like to welcome Mayor Kirk Caldwell. and Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. I will ask each of them to say a word about city and state initiatives underway to meet the climate crisis. The way this is going to work, it's a little unusual. The Lieutenant Governor is going to introduce our speaker tonight. And then at the end of the speech, our mayor, is going to say a few words um, after the talk, and then we will have the uh, uh, moderated Q&A session. So, mahalo, Lieutenant Governor Green. Hello, hi everyone. David Wallace Wells is a slightly scary writer, <laughs> but an incredibly warm person. Uh, in just a few moments uh, speaking with him, you can tell that his passion and intellect is going to help the planet. It is going to inform and motivate people across ethnicities, across socioeconomic boundaries, across political spectra, across international boundaries. It's extraordinary when someone falls into that. And that was not lost on me when we were speaking. He's written a book, as you know, The Uninhabitable Earth, which sounds like a bummer, I would say. <laughs> it's not great when you imagine, as he told me in a few minutes before our, uh, our speech tonight, his speech tonight, uh, what it would look like if millions of people were affected in a swath of the country and the world that they wouldn't be able to be outside for significant periods of time without dying, without having heart disease affect them. Can you imagine what that will do to refugees who have no resources perhaps and have to leave their countries and go elsewhere? The impact on our state, obviously, the mayor will speak eloquently about that, who's been doing excellent work, uh, is of great concern. But to our globe, the greatest concerns abound. It is not lost on us that there's an urgency. Our current administration has squandered four years, in my opinion, and it may be another four years before the leadership comes together to help guide, as he spoke with me, uh, uh, China, a partnership in some way, or with India. What will that look like? How can we as a globe get ahead of this crisis? And I wondered aloud to him, what will it look for populations that are already vulnerable we may be able to adjust. We may be able to acclimatize uh, in our own economic ways if we have assets or resources or live in a place where you can deal with the climate change. But what happens if you're homeless, as we know too many people in our state are, or in New York, or in all across the country or world? What happens if we build substandard housing just to keep a roof over their head, and then the impacts of global warming 
do the unthinkable, dislocate them again. These are the kind of topics that he takes up, which I think is extraordinary. Now, just as important, we should mention some of the places he's come from. He came from Brown, a great education. He's an editor at New York Magazine, which uh, Governor Abercrombie swears he read for many, many, many decades, and I believe it. <laughs> but what I was impressed by was uh, just how fluidly he went back and forth to his life. He has a 20-month-old baby, a baby named Raka. And I said, David, what does Raka mean? He says, it means rock. <laughs> so, so it's not lost on me that he's a normal guy <laughs> that fell, as he says, from a panic attack that lasted one month long into an extraordinary article, which Mayor Caldwell pointed out was seminal in his thinking, and into a novel that is not just a bestseller, but could have a global impact. So let's put our hands together for David so he can educate us on what will happen to our world. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, it's, I feel like there's so many people to thank. There's so many people who've been a part of putting this event on and also bringing me out here to Hawaii to, be, you know, um, to begin with. And it's, you know, it's like a too long a list to go through, but I, it, it makes me feel as though I'm speaking really to the whole island. And I hope that this conversation um, that we're having tonight will continue to spread throughout the island and throughout the state um, in the weeks and months ahead. I want to start, you know, I often start this way, but I want to start by saying a few things about myself to give you a sense of how I came to this subject and my own particular perspective on it. Because, you know, I'm up here tonight speaking about climate change, the climate crisis, and all the ways that this force will transform our lives if we don't get a hold of it soon. But I didn't come to that subject as a lifelong committed environmentalist. I never thought of myself as a nature person. I've never gone on a hike. I've never owned any pets. Um, <laughs> I've, you know, I've lived my whole life, really literally my whole life in New York City. And I always liked taking trips to places like Hawaii to visit nature. Um, but I also felt that I didn't live inside it. And in fact, that modern life, with all of its conveniences um, and protections, was a kind of fortress that defended us against the forces of nature, however intense they might be. In other words, I think I lived most of my life, like almost everyone I knew, at least in New York, I think things are a little bit different here, um, really complacent and totally deluded about the threat from climate change, which I took to be happening slowly, happening elsewhere to other people, and at a level of severity that didn't much threaten the way that I lived or any of my loved ones lived. And in each of those ways, on each of those three points, I now understand I was very, very wrong. But I want to talk about each of them in turn, both to give you a sense of my own awakening and also to illustrate um, how much more, how much farther we have to go in educating the public and educating ourselves about just what the scientific world tells us is likely to happen in the decades ahead and just how urgently we meet, need to remodel our politics to take a hold of this crisis and give, our ch give ourselves a chance of living in a prosperous, just, um, equitable, and stable future. So the three big delusions. First one I had was about the speed of change. And like a lot of people I know, I was raised to think of climate change as very slow. Started the Industrial Revolution. It had fallen to us to clean up the mess that our grandparents left behind so that our grandchildren wouldn't be dealing with the results. Um, in fact, James Hansen, who's one of the most outspoken, sometimes called an alarmist climate scientist, his book for a general audience on the subject is called Storms of My Grandchildren. That's the timeline that even people who were quite concerned about this issue long talked about. They even complained that the impacts were so far away that the public wouldn't engage. And they had a hard time expressing a sense of urgency when the public understood the crisis to be decades in the distance. But in fact, 
half of all of the emissions that have ever been produced from the burning of fossil fuels in the entire history of humanity have come in just the last 30 years. That's since Al Gore published his first book on warming. And it's since the UN established its IPCC climate change body, which signaled unmistakably to the world that there was a scientific consensus about this issue and that it was urgent. We've done more damage since then than we managed in all the centuries that came before, in all the millennia that came before. Which means also, distressingly, we've done more damage knowingly than we ever managed in ignorance. We're now starting to see those effects in real time. And this is a real change from how the world looked even just a few years ago. The wildfires that are burning in Sydney at present are unprecedented. In California, we saw similar fires in previous years, 2017 and 2018. Those were unprecedented, and yet in Australia, the fires are burning at least 20 times as much land. They've killed, scientists ex estimate, 1.2 billion animals. They forced evacuations in the thousands in a wealthy country prepared as almost no country in the world is prepared to deal with the effects of climate change. The fires in Australia, because plants store carbon, which means when they burn, they release carbon, the fires in Australia have released so much carbon that the emissions for Australia have doubled last year's level. The flooding in the Midwest that we saw this past spring delayed the planting of American crops by months. Many farmers couldn't plant their crops at all, which means that this year, American farmers made 40% of their income. The entire nation of farmers made 40% of their income on flood insurance and bailout money having to do with the China trade war. In Europe this summer, we saw a heat wave set a heat temperature record in June. Temperature records used to last decades, sometimes centuries. In Europe, a record was set in June. Then a new record was set in July. And then the record was approached again in August. So three times in a single summer. And you're seeing those effects here as well. The heat wave that you had here this summer and the marine heat wave, which is affecting the fish life and um, the, the quality of, of reef life around these islands is incredibly dramatic. The loss of beaches around the islands is visible to anyone who even takes a casual look. And yet I think it's also important to pull back and say, as soon as the end of this century, every beach that we know today, anywhere on the planet, will be underwater. Now some of that sand will move and new sand will be created, but no beach that you have ever walked on anywhere in your life will be as it was when you walked on it. That's happening as soon as a few decades from now. But my favorite example, favorite is a gross word to use in this context, but um, the, 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 the example that I always come back to when I think about the incredible speed with which real-time effects are now arriving is the experience of the city of Houston, which this past summer was hit by its fifth 500-year storm in five years. Now, you know, that term doesn't really mean what it used to, thanks to climate change. Um, but obviously, it used to refer to a storm you'd expect to hit once every five centuries. Five centuries ago, Hernando Cortez had just landed in Mexico. There were no European settlements in North America at all. So we're talking about a storm that you'd expect to hit once during that entire history, the settlement of the eastern seaboard, the establishment of colonies, the fighting of a genocide against the native peoples, the fighting of an American revolution, the building of a slave empire, the fighting of a civil war, industrialization, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, the American empire, the end of the Cold War, the end of history, September 11th, the financial crisis. We're talking about a storm we'd expect to hit once in all of that time. And Houston has been hit by five of them in the last five years. So what we're seeing almost everywhere we look on the planet is literally millennia of natural disasters and extreme weather. 
compressed into periods as short as just a few years. You know, I'm 37 years old, which means my life actually contains this entire story. When I was born, the planet's climate seemed stable. Scientists were worried about the medium term and the long term, but for the foreseeable future, things were okay. We are now standing on the brink of catastrophe, and that is because of what has been done in just those intervening three decades. This is not the legacy of our ancestors. It is the work of a single generation, ours. So that's the speed. Um, the second big delusion that I had was about the scope of climate change. I heard a lot growing up in school, listening to Al Gore, all the rest of it, I heard a lot about Arctic melt and sea level rise. And these are important things to think about. I know the islands of Hawaii are, are worrying about them quite a lot, as they should. But in a certain way, they're among the least pressing effects of climate change because the Arctic will melt over many centuries, meaning the effects of sea level rise, when they get really dramatic, will take place so far in the future, probably we'll be able to adapt to them so long as we you know, res responsibly govern ourselves um, and focus on the issues as we need to. All of these other impacts, which many people in the public are not even aware of, are arriving much more immediately, and they represent much more dramatic threats to the way we live this century. So take the economy. Some economists believe that by the year 2100, if we don't change course with climate change, the global GDP could be as much as 30% smaller than it would be without climate change, 30%. That's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Depression, and it would be permanent. There are impacts on agriculture and food production. By the end of the century, again, if we don't change course, those studying this say that just from temperature impacts, the grain yields we'd see around the world would fall by perhaps 50% or more. So we'd be using the same amount of land to produce food, or if we were using the same amount of land to produce food, we'd be getting only 50%, only half as much of it, and we'd be using it to feed probably twice as many people. And that's just the heat. Unfortunately, climate change also is good for all the bugs that make growing agriculture crops really hard, and it's really good for the growth of weeds, which also makes the growth of food really hard. And there's Recent research, which is quite eye-opening, the causality is not exactly clear. They think it has something to do with the level of carbon in the atmosphere, but the nutritional content of all crops has fallen over the last few decades, so that even as our food is becoming less, even, even as our food production capacity is becoming less productive, the food that we get is less nutritious. It's like we're producing more and more junk food for ourselves. There's a relationship between temperature and violence, which means if we get to the end of the century on the course that we're on, we could have twice as much war as we have today, possibly more. And that relationship between temperature and violence, that holds not just at the state level, it holds, believe it or not, at the individual level. So you'd see rates of murder and rape and domestic assault go up. There are studies showing that even when it's hotter out, Baseball pitchers retaliate more for hit batsmen than when it's cooler out. People get into more arguments when they're driving in their cars. Road rage is worse. Almost every aspect of interpersonal dynamics gets worse when it's hot out, and the world is getting considerably hotter. Temperature and relatedly particulate pollution that's produced from the burning of fossil fuels affects cognitive performance. It affects rates of premature birth and low birth weight. It affects the development of children in utero and out of utero. You can see the effect on a person's lifetime earnings based on how many days in the womb they spent when it was over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. There is a measurable statistical effect of that heat on the performance of children throughout their lives. Now, it's small, but it's measurable, which is incredible. Nearly every aspect of physical health and mental health is affected both by temperature and particulate pollution. So rates of schizophrenia and ADHD go up. Um, admissions to mental hospitals go up. Um, respiratory illnesses, you know, uh, heart disease. Nearly every aspect of human well-being is affected by climate change, which is to say damaged by it. 
And for all of these reasons, I think no matter what you care about in the world, no matter what you're focused on as a political cause or personal project, climate change is tied up in it. So if you care about wealth creation, there's that impact on economic growth. If you care about economic inequality, it's important to keep in mind that climate change punishes unequally, punishing the developing world much more intensely than the developed world. And that, is, that pattern holds true also within nations and at the community level, so that particular parts of the United States, say, that are poorer will be hit harder and will be able to respond less well because they are less well off. And even at the level of communities and cities, it is the parts of those cities that are poorest and most disempowered who are often most in the path of extreme weather and disaster. And so no matter what level you look at, if you're worried about inequalities, climate change is there too. If you're worried about violence, if you're worried about conflict, if you're worried about state collapse, no matter what political cause you have on your mind, climate change plays a role and must be focused on. For me, this, this was a kind of a, it's almost embarrassing to say, but it was such a profound revelation. I grew up thinking I lived outside of nature, and I started to realize not only do I live within nature, sort of at its discretion, but nearly every aspect of my life and anything that I hoped for in my own life or in the life of the people that I shared the planet with would be affected by this. I started to see this is not a limited problem. It's not about sea level rise, which we can escape if we live somewhere other than the coast. It is an all-encompassing story, which governs everything we do. And no matter who you are, where you are, what country you live in, how wealthy you are, your life will be affected in some way too. Even though there's some people who will be affected more and others less, some countries the same, no matter where you are, this will be the story of your lifetime. So that's the scope of change. The third is about severity. Up until quite recently, you know, the worst warming that we heard about was two degrees of Celsius. Um, scientists called this level of warming catastrophic. Island nations of the world called it genocide. And whenever they talked about it, whenever advocates, scientists talked about this level of warming, politicians, they would say, we need to do whatever we can to avoid that level of warming. And I think that led a lot of people, including me, to think that two degrees was about a worst case scenario. But practically speaking, I think it's a best case scenario. And I wanna walk you through a little bit of why I think that. Um, at the moment, the planet is 1.1 degrees warmer than it was before the Industrial Revolution. Now, 1.1 degrees doesn't sound like very much but it already puts us entirely outside the window of temperatures that enclosed all of human history. So the planet has never been as hot as it is today when there were humans around to walk on it. And that means that everything that we have ever known as a species, the development of the human animal, the rise of agriculture and through agriculture of rudimentary civilization and through that of modern civilization, everything we know about ourselves as biological creatures, social creatures, political creatures, emotional creatures, all of that is the result of climate conditions we have already today left behind. So it's like we've landed on an entirely new planet with a totally different climate. And we have to figure out what of the civilization we've brought with us today can survive these new conditions, what will have to be reformed or renovated, and what will have to be discarded and replaced. And that's just at 1.1 degree of warming, which is unprecedented in all of human history. Scientists say that if we immediately globally decarbonize today, never again emitted another ounce of carbon, by the way, we're emitting 37 billion tons every year. Um, if we never emitted another ounce, we would probably get about a half degree more of warming from just the carbon that's in the pipeline today, since some of these processes take a while to play out in the natural world. And that means that in that absolutely best case scenario, we'd be landing at about 1.5 or 1.6 degrees of warming. But given all the political and economic and cultural obstacles to that kind of decarbonization, I think practically speaking, something like two degrees is a best case for us. At that level, just two degrees, which we're likely to see probably 2040, maybe 2050 if we're lucky, Damages from storms would grow a hundredfold. A hundredfold. 
they would get a hundred times worse globally. <laughs> Cities in South Asia and the Middle East would be so hot, as Lieutenant Governor was quoted me saying earlier, that um, you wouldn't be able to walk around outside during summer heat waves without risking heat stroke or death. These are cities that today hold 10 or 12 or 15 million people. They'd be so hot in just a few decades that tens of thousands of them would be dying every year just for the, by risking, by, from the risk of walking outside. That's one reason why the UN believes that we could see 200 million climate refugees, again, just at two degrees, which we're likely to see by about 2040 or 2050. They think it's possible we could get to one billion which is as many people as live today in North and South America combined. Actually, I think those numbers are a bit high, but even if you take the low number and divide it in half, you still get 100 million refugees, which is 100 times as many as left Syria and went into Europe and totally scrambled that continent's politics in ways that we're dealing with even today, even in the United States. The beginning of the, of the international populist wave that we're living through today began with the Syrian civil war, which is a climate war. There were other factors, of course. Lebanon next door dealt with these issues and survived intact. But Syria would not have fallen into disarray if it were not for drought. And we're still dealing with the political impacts of that. The UN believes we could see at least 200 times as big a refugee impact just by 2040 or 2050. At two degrees, still at just two degrees, Scientists believe that globally 153 million additional people would die from air pollution produced from the burning of fossil fuels, which is death at the scale of 25 holocausts. And at just north of two degrees, we'd probably lock into inevitability the permanent loss of all the planet's ice sheets, which would bring over centuries 250 feet of sea level rise which is enough to drown two-thirds of the world's major cities, maybe 80%, if we didn't move them, which we probably would. This is our best case scenario. So how much worse from there can it get? Considerably worse. How much is an open question, and there are a lot of debates about exactly what trajectory path we're on with emissions. But according to some estimates, by the end of the century, if we don't take action, we could be dealing with $600 trillion in global climate damages, which is twice all the wealth that exists in the world today. And parts of the planet could be hit by six climate-driven natural disasters at once. Now, I believe that the human species is resilient and adaptive, and we will find ways to live under some of these new conditions. But the question is, what level of suffering and difficulty will we be trying to adapt to? How much can we possibly, how much more difficult can we make these questions for ourselves? Or theoretically, how much easier? I think that even in our best case, we will be dealing with an unprecedented amount of human suffering. That is more suffering due to climate change than has ever been experienced in the entire history of the species. That probably sounds like bad news. Um, <laughs> well, you know, obviously it's really awful news. Um, <laughs> but I do think in a certain way there is a silver lining here. And um, I hope I don't sound foolish for saying this, but ultimately, as terrifying as some of these scenarios are, they are reflections of our power over the climate. If we get to three or four degrees, Frankly, even if we get to two degrees, even if we get to 1.5 degrees, which we're definitely gonna get to, we will only be getting there because of choices we are making. Which means we can make a different set of choices, our, yeah, two, in theory at least. Now that may sound Pollyannish, and the obstacles are enormous, but it's just a simple fact that the main driver of climate change is human action, carbon emissions, how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. And collectively, our hands are on those levers, which means that we can write the story of the planet's climate future ourselves. And not just can, we will, because inaction is just a different kind of action. We're gonna be writing that story whether we like it or not. <laughs> 
And not just writing it, but living it. And not just as observers, but as protagonists. This isn't just any story. All of us are holding the fate of the world in our hands. It makes me uncomfortable to use some of this language, but it's the kind of story that we used to only recognize in mythology and theology. The planet has been brought from the brink, from stability to the brink of catastrophe in just 30 years, and scientists now say we have about that much time to take action and avoid the worst case impacts, which means almost all of us will be here for at least some and possibly most of that next part of the story too. What happens next? So what would a happy next act look like? What kind of relatively prosperous, relatively livable, relatively just future can we imagine? I think a happy outcome would probably mean solar arrays barnacling the planet almost everywhere you looked. Although it's also the case that if we figured out a new form of battery technology to transmit that power, we wouldn't need to put um, those arrays everywhere. It's been estimated that just a sliver of the Sahara Desert absorbs enough sunlight to power the entire world's energy needs. And in the US, we are using more land today in coal plants than we would need to provide all of the country's power through solar energy. We'd probably need a new electric grid to transmit that energy, because in the US today, two thirds of produced power is lost as waste heat from the production site to the use point. Two thirds of that power is lost. That's not much worse than it is elsewhere in the world. So we'd probably need to build an entirely new electric grid and maybe even an entirely new kind of electric grid. We might need some uh, new nuclear power, um, since in the entire history of fossil fuels, the only energy source that's ever been reliably, um, you could count on to reliably displace fossil fuel energy has been nuclear in parts of Europe. But probably it would have to be an entirely different kind of nuclear energy, because today renewables are cheaper than nuclear power. In fact, they're so much cheaper that in many parts of the world, it's cheaper to build new renewable capacity than simply to continue running old, dirty energy infrastructure. That is a rapid change, which is an incredibly exciting part of our near-term future. We probably need a new kind of plane, because planes produce an enormous amount of carbon. And even though there's some movement to reduce air travel on an individual level, I think it's really hard to imagine all of the hundreds of millions of people, especially in the developing world, who have just gotten wealthy enough to afford air travel for the first time. So I think what we need is a new kind of plane that flies on a different kind of fuel and doesn't cook the planet. And given that we probably can't ask the entire world to entirely give up on meat either, I think we probably need a new kind of agriculture as well. But perhaps an old kind of agriculture is a better way to think of, think of it, because we know that there are practices, regenerative agriculture, et cetera, that can, say, turn cattle farms, which are carbon sources, into carbon sinks, which absorb carbon. Maybe we'll be growing some of that meat in labs, and maybe we can feed our cattle seaweed, because actually, if you feed them just a little bit of seaweed, their methane emissions, it's another greenhouse gas, goes down, which is the reason they're a problem, it goes down by 95 to 99%. Probably we're going to have to do all three of those just in the agricultural sector, because as with every other aspect of this challenge, climate change is just too big to solve with any single silver bullet solution. It requires us to take action on all fronts, in all ways, with all tools, and immediately. And no matter how many tools we deploy, we probably won't be able to do enough. We're no longer in a position when we can even dream of beating climate change, only limiting it and learning to live with it. That's the terrifying math we face. But it's also the challenge for all of us. It means we probably will have to be deploying a whole raft of solutions dealing with what are called negative emissions, which allow us to take carbon out of the atmosphere, 
in addition to decarbonizing rapidly. That'll mean billions, possibly even trillions of new trees planted. And it will probably also mean whole plantations of what are called carbon capture machines that can take the carbon out of the atmosphere at an industrial level. Now the UN in their prospectus, looking at how we could avoid catastrophic warming, they want us to move so quickly on decarbonization, it would be unprecedented in the entire history of human energy use. And I want to just to pause there for a second. They, in order to avoid catastrophic warming, we need to cut our emissions by 7.5% per year over the next decade globally. No nation, no single nation in the entire history of humanity has ever cut its emissions by 7.5% in any single year ever. And the UN says that in order to do, in order to avoid catastrophic warming, the entire planet needs to do that every single year between now and 2030. In addition to that decarbonization, they say that we need to build a negative emissions carbon capture industry at least twice as big and maybe four times as big as today's oil and gas business, which took a century and a half to develop and globally employs tens of millions of people. They say we need to complete that build out of that entirely new industry by 2030. We probably need an entirely new kind of infrastructure because if cement were a country, it would be the world's third biggest emitter. And China is now pouring as much cement every three years as the US poured in the entire 20th century. And we're going to have to start thinking about seawalls and levees and protecting vulnerable populations all around the world, but maybe especially on the coasts, many of whom are so poor they can't afford that kind of technology themselves, which is why I think it must also mean the end of a narrowly nationalistic geopolitics which allow us to define the suffering of people living elsewhere in the world as insignificant when we even acknowledge it. None of that's going to be easy. But the only obstacles are human ones. Science is not stopping us from taking action, and neither is technology. We have the tools we need today to start. Of course, we have the tools we need today to end global poverty, epidemic disease, and the abuse of women as well. And that's why I think even more than new tools and new tech, what we need is a new politics, a new way of overcoming those human obstacles, our economics, our culture, our short-sightedness, our status quo bias, which makes us reluctant to make any meaningful change, our disinterest in considering anything really scary, our reflex to define political goals in terms of what we think of as practical and possible rather than what we know is necessary, and the selfishness of the world's rich and powerful who have the least incentive to change anything. Now, they will suffer too, everyone will, but not as much as those with the least, who have done the least to cause this problem and who will be shouldering the biggest parts of its impacts in the decades ahead. A new politics will make the matter of managing the burden of climate change the central priority of our age, which it has to be. Now, I wrote my book over the course of 2018. I turned it in in September of 2018. And I ended it on some mix of a couple of the notes, the quasi-hopeful notes that I've just sketched out. That ultimately, though climate change is terrifying, the fact that it is terrifying is a reflection of our power and that politics offers a path to real transformation. I think for a long time, we've let ourselves be taught that we, define our, that we define our world and make our mark on the world through what we buy and what we consume. But politics is there to make a much more dramatic reorientation of our priorities, and it's sitting right in front of us as a path towards progress on climate. Now, 
I thought both of those things were true when I concluded the book on that note, but I only sort of half believed them. And that's because when I looked back on the recent history of environmental activism, in my research I'd spoken to many people who had devoted their whole lives to this fight and produced, practically speaking, no progress. Every year our emissions went up. Every year we made the problem worse. Even though we knew what we were doing, we couldn't stop ourselves from doing more damage every single year. I believed in a political path forward, but I wasn't sure what it would look like, what it would take, or how fast it could possibly come. So I turned my, my book in in September of 2018. I had not heard of Greta Thunberg. Nobody outside of Sweden had. Practically speaking, nobody inside of Sweden had. She had just been striking for a few weeks, a lonely, literally friendless 15-year-old outside Swedish parliament with a single sign. Now we're a little more than a year later, she has led a global movement numbering in the millions, a globe, truly global movement climate strikes in South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, in East Asia, not to mention the US and, and Western Europe. When I turned my book in, I had never heard of Extinction Rebellion. They had not even been founded in the UK. Within six months of being founded, they had forced a conservative British parliament to declare a climate emergency and commit to zero carbon by 2050. Now, that's not fast enough for me, I think it's not fast enough for the planet, but it's an incredible step forward given how slow moving politics have been on this front for so long. And yet the British parliament was followed by leadership in Finland and Norway and Denmark, each of whom made even more ambitious pledges than the UK. I think their pledges are actually so ambitious they can't possibly be met. They want to get to zero carbon by 2030, which seems Crazy to me, but in any event, we're seeing incredible movement on this front. When I turned my book in, we had not yet elected Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Congress. The Green New Deal was the name of Jill Stein's climate policy, not a major subject of debate in the highest levels of American government. We are now walking through a democratic primary season, there's a debate today, in which candidates are in a, engaged in an arms race, competing to be more serious than the one to their left and the one to their right on this issue, that is unthinkable. And of the major serious remaining candidates, Joe Biden, who's probably the least forward thinking of the four of them, his presidency on climate would be miles more ambitious than anything that was achieved under the Obama administration. That is how fast our politics on this issue is changing. We are living in an entirely different world than I even thought was possible just a year or so ago. And that's important not just because of what is possible now, but because it suggests a path forward. If what was impossible to contemplate two years ago is now possible, that means that with continued momentum, much more ambitious action could become possible in the years ahead. And that is vital because even with all of this momentum at the level of protest, at the level of public opinion, which is moving in unprecedented, at unprecedented rates too, at the level of political leadership in the US and around the world, even with all that momentum, we need a lot more momentum than we've got. And we also need to leverage that into actual policy um, commitments, which in most parts of the world have not yet been made, even as our politics is shifting. If we need, as the UN says, a World War II scale mobilization on climate, that is much easier to imagine today than it would have been a year ago when they called for it and certainly five years ago, when climate scientists would have been reluctant to even talk in those terms because they were scared of how scared the public would be of those issues. So we're in an incredibly privileged position, not just to be 
alive during the most consequential decades in all of human history and to be acting ourselves every day to shape our future. But because even today in 2020, the possibilities for action are so much bigger and more dramatic than they seem, than seemed possible just a short time ago. At least that's one way of thinking of it. <laughs> Another way is we signed the Paris Accords three years ago, 2016. No major industrial nation on earth is on track to meet its commitments under Paris. Even if we met them, we'd probably get about three degrees of warming, which as I sketched out earlier would be quite catastrophic. And just since the signing of the Paris Accords, we've seen the election of Donald Trump in the US, of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, and the self-appointment of Xi Jinping in China as president for life. So as much progress as, as has been made, we need dramatically more. Because as those three leaders show, she is a little bit of a different case, but certainly as Trump and Bolsonaro or Scott Morrison in Australia show, climate change won't necessarily produce political movement in only one direction. There are risks of moving in the other direction as well towards a more zero-sum view of the world, a sense of resource competition, and a growing commitment among leaders of particular nations to the security and well-being of their citizens rather than the security and well-being of the world as a whole. We are living through that wave today, and it is up to us to turn the tide. In a world as divided as ours, and it, in which it's so hard to imagine collective global action, it is absolutely incumbent on all of us to do whatever we can to build those kinds of coalitions and forms of consensus and cooperative networks. Because climate change is a global problem, it can only be solved globally, and it can only be solved by humans. The challenge before us is to secure a livable, prosperous, and relatively just future for future generations. And no matter who you are, no matter what you do, that job is yours. The task is ours. So thank you. And here's the mayor. <laughs> Good evening and aloha. So I had a few comments from the perspective of the city and county of Honolulu and, and Oahu and probably the state of Hawaii. Um, read the article and we're starting our climate change office. The first one in the United States with the name climate change in any city. Sat down with Josh and said, we need to do a lot more. We need to get through this together. And since then, we've done all kinds of stuff. United Ameris Directive almost immediately resulted in our rail project to raise the podiums of their stations in town so that it can address climate change. A six feet of sea level rise. You know, we're adjusting our codes, plumbing, electrical, and others. We're planting hundreds of thousands of trees. We're filing a lawsuit against the large big oil companies. Uh, we're banning plastics. We're not allowing walls to be built, and it's having impact on people, friends of ours, who are upset. We're going to be raising podiums of buildings in town. The city doesn't retreat. The city hardens in the city areas, but we retreat in other areas. We're rebuilding our infrastructure. We're looking at electric buses. We are taking action, but we're also getting huge pushback from our friends, people we know in this room. The efforts on plastic, we turned some of our leaders who I've never seen become protesters out protesting in front of Honolulu Holly. And it, you know, it, it, it's part of the challenge. 
And it's not coming from headquarters far away. It's coming from headquarters right in downtown Honolulu. And we really should know better. And David made that point. You know, I got this book in Munich coming back from a vacation. It's paperback. And guys out front, he, they have the hardback. They said, how did I get this? You got to go to Europe to get it. <laughs> Everyone in Europe is reading this book. And I'd read the article. I read the book. I got back. I was jet lagged. And so I'd wake up in the middle of the night at 3 usually, and I thought I'd read this book. But I could never fall asleep again. Because then I laid in bed worrying and thinking, i got to tell Josh, we got to do a lot more, a lot quicker. <laughs> and, I, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I got the book in Munich because we were coming back from Egypt because I wanted to take my wife and daughter to see the pyramids, a bucket list. But yes, I flew on a jet plane all the way from Honolulu, all the way there and all the way back. But I went there, you know, and it is one of the wonders of the world, and it's an incredible story of what the Egyptians did. But it made me think of things like the Great Wall of China and what humans did there. And even coming home here to my island where I grew up, the island of Hawaii, you know, Pu Kohola, the Hayao that Kamehameha the Great built before he went off to conquer the other islands. You know, a lot of hands touched a lot of pohaku, a lot of stone to build this. And that gives me hope. You know, us humans need a purpose. We need to belong, and we need great things to do together. And it goes to David's point. It made me think in 2016, I think, when Hurricane Lane collapsed in front of Waikiki, a Category 5 hurricane that whipped up overnight and fell apart within a day, luckily. And then I took off to go to the ending of Jerry Brown's Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. And I got there feeling pretty hopeless. One, I got there, and then the New Wano Reservoir was going to flood and maybe breach and flood Waikiki, Honolulu, and I'm in now San Francisco. Not a good thing for a mayor. But I sat there listening and thinking it's hopeless. And then I saw tribal women from Africa. I heard some of the largest Fortune 500 company executives. I heard United Nations leaders and prime ministers and environmentalists, all kinds of people talking about what they were doing on our planet Earth to address our climate crisis. So I think there is hope that we can bend the arc of our climate crisis and create a green, habitable, and just global economy. I believe we can. It's incumbent on us to take action and to lead. I want to thank David for his courage, and I hope you do not stop talking about this. You're only 37, got a lot of years to continue to make sure that we bend that arc to a more green and more just environmental world. Thank you. Mahalo, everyone.